Hi, my name is Abhishek Kathuria. I'm a faculty here at the Indian School of Business and I study research and practice at the intersection of technology and strategy. Today we have with us Mr. K. Ganesh. Ganesh is a serial entrepreneur and he's a promoter of several large firms including Big Basket, Homelane, Bluestone and Protea Medical. Ganesh, thank you for being here. Nice it's pleasure. wonderful having you here. Uh, thanks for uh, spending your time with us. You have a very interesting background in terms of your entrepreneurial journey, in terms of what you've done. Um, can you tell us about your journey, the challenges you've faced uh, as you've moved along this entrepreneurial path of yours? Yeah. So <clears throat> I was working in corporate. I was executive assistant to Shiv Nadar of HCL post my I am Calcutta. Uh, back in 1990s when I started my first business before entrepreneurship or venture capital uh, were even talked about uh, talked about in India. So as I my first time at the time, there's no venture capitalist, bootstrapped, self-funded business, which was into very non-glamorous computer maintenance. It's almost like a computer mechanic. Uh, we were the first companies to provide a multi-party, multi-vendor computer maintenance to corporates. So, so 1990, that is, then we scaled it and sold it to iGate. Then I started my second venture as uh, founder and CEO, which was one of the first uh, uh, BPO companies out of India. So uh, it's currently called First Source, listed in India, part of the Sanjeev Goenka Group. Uh, after selling that, I started my next venture, which was into high-end uh, analytics business. Again, this was before data analytics or KPO and big data became uh, uh, buzzwords. Uh, this was back in 2003, uh, where we used to do high-end analytics for Fortune 50 companies out of India. We used to hire PhDs and MBAs in India and do analytics modeling for that. And my fourth venture was in uh, education, wherein I uh, it's a company called Tutor Vista, which we started and scaled and sold to Pearson. So that has been four uh, serial Greenfield Ventures as founder and CEO. So for uh, post the last exit, last 10 years, what we have been doing is a venture build-up platform. Almost see of it, think of it as a parallel entrepreneurship instead of serial entrepreneurship. So we look at where the next 10 years opportunities are, uh, do some basic research, uh, get a strong founding team together, put the initial money, write the business plan, and start executing. So that's the parallel entrepreneurship or venture builder model. Uh, the platform is called growthstory.in, and Big Basket was the first one uh, from that. Then we had a company called Bluestone, which is the largest online jewelry company in India, fine jewelry company. And we have Homelane, we have Portia Medical, we have 10 such companies under the parallel entrepreneurship platform. So that's how the journey has been, has been over these years. So this is a lovely list of really large companies that you've promoted. Big Basket, uh, Bluestone, Homelane. Is there any secret sauce behind your process of identifying, nurturing these companies? I mean, how do you make this work? How do you, how do you find these companies? Are there something? Is there something specific that you look for when you when when you find these companies? Are there some specific checklists you go through as you nurture these companies along their journey to become these successful enterprises? Yeah. No. Thank you for your kind, encouraging words. Uh, so, a couple of caveats. So one, as they say, it's all uh, mutual funds and financial instruments. Past performance is not indicative of future returns. So while there have been some, uh, we are lucky to have good successes, uh, the jury is out on each of the company till the time they actually monetize in one form or the other. So uh, that's one caveat. And uh, second caveat is uh, we are all MBAs. So normally we you know we are very good at talking, presenting and modeling. Uh, we do something, whenever it works out, we take full credit for it. And when it doesn't work out, we blame it on the weather or on the government or on competition. So um, uh, really a lot of it also depends on being at the right time. Yeah. Okay, right, at the right place. So we've been very fortunate and lucky for this success. Uh, so this is my attempt at uh, humility, which normally I don't display. But uh, the fact, so seriously speaking, I think uh, there's no secret sauce. What has worked for us, and there are a lot of things that has not worked for us. We don't talk about it. We hide it under the carpet. But uh, ultimately, it's about trying enough times so that you are able to succeed some of the time. It's almost like saying 
uh, if you take 100 shots at the goal, the chances are you will get five goals done. Okay, right? So step one, the secret sauce is keep trying, be out there and try more. That's one. And some of the constant things that we have followed, some of the um, general principles that we have followed is, we have looked at the Indian market. We have looked at where the opportunities are in Indian market. And we have looked at how can we build large companies. So some threads are one, focus on the core sectors. What are the core sectors? Roti, Kapda, Makan, Healthcare, Education. Okay, right? So, so <laughs> if you go to the core sector, you cannot go wrong because it's a large market. It's a deep need. So that has been one philosophy. The second philosophy has been, we believe strongly that we don't have a magic wand. We don't have a secret sauce that we can outdo or out-execute somebody else better. I may have a lot of complaints about the way the banks works in India, retail works in India, education institution works in India. I have a lot of suggestions, a lot of free gyan. But the moment I start doing that business, I will make as many, if not more, mistakes. I will be a miserable failure. So what we try to do is, we don't try to out-execute anybody. We try to see, can I disrupt the status quo? Disrupt not as a oh. cliche or a <clears throat> jargon word. Can I use something different so that I change the status quo? Now that ensures that I'm coming in with a new angle. I don't have competitors. I'm the first mover there. And that has really helped us. Just as an example, if you talk about grocery, I don't think we can do better than Reliance Retail or better than Spencer's or Neil Giri's or Food World. But if I came up with e-grocery, then I'm the first mover or first large player. And I can scale, I can do that, I can make mistakes. The, pe the markets give me a long rope, the investors give me a long rope to make mistakes and learn. Similarly, Portia Medical. Okay, right? I can't run a better hospital than the Manipals of the world or work huts of the world. I just can't do it or care hospitals. But this is a company that do outside of hospital home care. Can I, for those things which cannot be done at the hospital or which has to be done at home or which can be more conveniently done at home, we created Portia Medical out of hospital care, which is almost 50%. So, uh, I wouldn't call it secret sauce, but some of the things that has worked for us is go after core sectors, go after big markets, come in with a way to change the status quo by using technology or internet or data or a different way of doing business then you have higher probability of success. Like I said, there have been a lot of failures, but because we keep trying, the success is what we talk about. Casting your eye out into the future over the next 10 years, because you said you also have a 10 year horizon, right? Um, where do you see, what are the next disruptive ideas that, you, that you're currently looking at, working or thinking of, which might disrupt the way business is done in India? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, because uh, they say for anybody who has got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> to be to be everything right from chat GPT to, <laughs> to, to anything that happens looks like an idea and potential for a huge amount of, huge amount of opportunity. But obviously, after that, you temper down with wisdom and say that, <laughs> say that, listen, is there really a business model there? Exactly. And all that. So, uh, a lot of this ideas also evolves as market changes and new opportunities come up. So, but if you ask me to uh, specify some of them now, yeah. one, I think this entire uh, area about artificial intelligence, machine learning, large language modeling, developments in those, using those to come in and play a disruptive role in core sectors is huge. Take, for example, healthcare. Okay, right? Uh, AI has been talked about and used a lot in multiple sectors, whether it's mm -hmm. e-commerce, self-driving cars, many of those sectors already been used. But in healthcare, it is very little been used. So uh, AI in healthcare, for right from mental health, how we personally manage, to how we can predict yeah. uh, healthcare event happening, so that we don't rush people to ICU, we are able to predict beforehand. Each of this use of AI and machine learning to be able to see patterns, to be able to predict uh, and come into healthcare is a huge opportunity. So I think one set of opportunities is based on using this AI, ML and latest development, including uh, large language modeling in the core sectors to be able to change the way. That's one. 
Two is the area of corporate digital disruption, innovation and transformation. We have seen startups coming up, a unicorn being built. And whenever I see to speak to uh, people in large corporates, they are scared, they are concerned about whether their lunch will get eaten, they will get decimated, what happened to a Xerox or a Kodak, uh, Kodak cameras or Blackberry, will, will it happen here and how to do that. Now, it's not an easy challenge because they already are large companies with existing success. And they, so to compete with a startup that is disrupting based on venture capital funding is very difficult. But that's an area I think that we'll see a lot of startup and opportunities coming up of entrepreneurs trying to use these things to help corporate. So B2B businesses that will help corporate address this digital transformation and to make use of all the new developments uh, in their existing, current, legacy, large businesses. That's the second area that I think is a, a, a big sector. Third, we have already seen the success of companies like Zoho and Freshdesk in the SaaS world. Say, Correct. In the SaaS from India for the global market. I think the areas of vertical SaaS, a lot more SaaS opportunities in developer ops, in developer tools, in vertical SaaS from India for global markets is, again, a huge, huge area that will come in. The fourth area is entire B2B e-commerce we still have not seen. If you see the B2B supply chain, B2B channel, there is huge amount of inefficiency that still exists. We have seen only really B2C e-commerce. We have not seen B2B. So I think the opportunity to carve out inefficiencies in B2B across channels, across supply chain, across stages. And the sectors you've talked about are sectors that are impactful in India. Right, I mean, yes. healthcare or B two B. These are sectors that haven't been, uh, you know, they have not seen an impact so far. They've been underserved by technology and disruption in the past. Yeah, professor, that's a very interesting point. One of the things that we firmly believe in, and which is why we are, I have spent all my life in India, worked in India, and in startups in India, uh, is uh, this India opportunity per se, exactly. right? Because a lot of things are broken. And I'm not saying in the, the negative sense to do India bashing. I love India. <laughs> because a lot of things are broken. Opportunity for entrepreneurs to come up with models to solve and build large valuable companies is phenomenal. Whereas uh, in US as an example, it's a very developed country. You don't have challenge of getting water, getting power, Okay, right. generating your own, having your own transport. None of that really exists. Here in India, we start the day by thinking about, will I have water, will I have power, will be, uh, Uber or Ola come, you know, all this. Exactly. But on the positive side of this is, each one is an opportunity. Absolutely. If I had to start the same businesses in US, I would have to be really brilliant. Okay, right. So India today is home to 77,000 startups as per the DPI, right? Um, so we've come a long way. And you've come a long way. You've seen this entire journey or the, the transformation of the ecosystem. Can you now just, earlier I asked you if you could look into the future. Can you turn your gaze back to the past? How has this changed? How has the entrepreneurial ecosystem changed over the past 30 odd years, 10 years, right? Um, things obviously have, there have been certain milestones that have happened. The way companies have come up has changed. So in your view, what's really changed? Why, why do we see what we're seeing today based on what's happened in the past? Yeah. So I started in 1990, about 33 years back, my first, first company. At that time, almost it was, uh, you will, the concept of first generation entrepreneur or entrepreneur was not there. It, even the word was not there. So several, several things have happened. So one, obviously, uh, thanks to the success of entrepreneurs, the valuations, exit, front page news, entrepreneurship is not seen as the last option available when you can't get a job. Okay, right? Yeah. One. Two, I think uh, also government across parties have started simplifying uh, the process and procedures. So it's fairly much, 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 much easier. Okay, it's a separate topic. We still have a lot of complaints, a lot of things still need to be fixed, but we have come a very long way from bureaucracy, the permissions required, the challenges required to be able to start, start a business. Still more need to go, but long way we have come, that's two. Third, what has also happened is the government 
uh, including the current government, the prime minister, have put startups on the front page. They are startup on the thing. So it has become aspirational, whether it's a startup uh, 20, G20 movement or startup initiative, several policies that they have come up with, all of them focused on the entrepreneur. That shows the government values entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. values startups. It's no longer, thing. otherwise every policy used to be cement, used to be power sector, used to be large thing and all that. But here no policy talks about, comes up where the startup is not on the focus. Whether you take the budget, whether you take any, any pronouncement to come, which has really made the level aspiration, the level aspirational. And also the ecosystem, the rest of the ecosystem, even outside government has come up very strongly. A lot of people have come back from the US, having worked in the Silicon Valley, come back to India because of opportunities in multiple things. That has brought in a lot of venture capital ecosystem, a startup ecosystem from there. That's one. Two, the fact that global majors set up their R&D centers in India. Hyderabad mm -hmm. is one, Bagalore is two. They're all, they set up, which means no longer are you talking about simple back office process being outsourced. The R&D center for Cisco, for Microsoft, for these companies are in India. What it does is, the Indian engineers passing out of Indian colleges get to work on the latest top level technology, which is which their counterparts in US are working. Now, this has never happened 10, 15 years back. So as a result, the pool of engineers with cutting edge technology and knowledge as best as anywhere in the world has happened. So that has given rise to starting tech startups now. If you had mm -hmm. asked me the same question 15 years back, I would say it more services startup because the people did not exist. Now, courtesy Qualcomm's of the world, Microsoft's of the world, Google's of the world, you have people who have worked in India for last five, 10 years on top projects in India and who are willing to leave that and start up here. So I think that groundswell of critical mass of people available in India to start has happened. Similarly, angel investor, accelerators, incubators in the educational institutions, including ISB and all of this stuff. So, and, and then venture capitals, uh, capitalists, almost all the top venture capitalists are in India and have India focused funds. So I think it's almost like magically all the ducks are in order. Mm -hmm. They have come together unbelievably. Angel investors, mentors, advisors, government support, uh, the ecosystem, venture risk investment, the people available, change in minds of aspirational thing, taking risk, I think has brilliantly come together to be able to do this. That's today a very, very long cry from where we started with 32 years back, and which you can see the result, the number of unicorns that we are producing, the number of startups, 77,000 startups registered at DPIT. If you ask me, it will be 10 times more of non-registered total startups. Absolutely. But more important, importantly, the uh, aspirational levels, the enthusiasm uh, to start companies is the way to go. Talking again, just taking a step back again, more a uh, broader look again at the startup ecosystem. And you've alluded, you've alluded to how the ecosystem changed, how the other supporting players changed, how the government policies changed. You've got a bunch of players who support organizations as they start up and go through their growth journey, be it the government, be it incubators. How have they evolved over time? I know you alluded to it a little bit in your earlier answer. But if you could give us some more detail in terms of, in your experience, how have things specifically changed when you talk, look at incubators, when you look at governments, and how have they helped expand and grow the ecosystem? Yeah, so w one of the requirements of the startups to flourish, because in the initial days, they will lose money. You need risk capital, right? Because especially if you're talking about new age startups, especially if you're talking about companies uh, that are trying to disrupt, it takes time before they make money. You need risk capital. So fortunately, risk capital came in because venture capital investors from the world over and some domestic venture capital investors came into India and started seeding the startup. But there was a downside to it, okay, right? These were all focused on tech business model, technology business model, which will have a hockey stick growth. Yes. Right. Unfortunately, not all business models are not like that. They're all good business model for valuation, for growth, but that's only small part of entrepreneurship. Okay, right? Hardcore entrepreneurship is not tech-led, 
valuation led hockey stick growth business models so that was something that was lacking because that's not a focus of venture capitalists i'm not saying they're wrong that's that's not their focus so rest of the segments other than this glamorous tech vc supported segment were languishing or were not getting the support one of the biggest thing that has happened is because of the government push and initiative we have gone more horizontal okay right the number of programs that the government is launching for capacity building the number of grants people like departments of science and technology and others have government funding startups okay right through through venture capital through being fund of funds in, into this so several of these initiatives has helped in broad basing the startup activity to beyond the normal tech vc led thing for example um, the uh, if you take agriculture if you take rural areas if you take business models which are not really scalable like the tech venture capital led business model but highly profitable business models so those entrepreneurs in those sectors can now go to accelerators incubators through them access government funds get the help of angel networks social capital people family officers who are willing to support and even csr funding all of those routes have now opened up for various sectors i think that has been singular change second is organizations like the indus entrepreneurs tai and other entrepreneurship organization are conducting several programs okay in multiple cities including tier 2 cities just to evangelize spread the word okay right and give inputs and fire up the imagination in people i think that is true and and thirdly you talked about accelerators incubators in educational institutions most of the education many education institutions have these initiatives entrepreneurship cell and this which again uh, make it possible for a student to start looking at entrepreneurship that exposure was not there when i did my i am calcutta graduation there is no course on entrepreneurship right there is nothing there but now here the person comes he can join the entrepreneurship cell he can do something whether he actually does a startup or goes and joins a top corporate because they pay very high salaries it's a different matter but entrepreneurship is, has has already come in i am seeing the fact that in schools they are introducing entrepreneurship mm-hmm. curriculum or entrepreneurship as subject or a chapter which is a great way i think at grassroots level to expose people to entrepreneurship is a change that has that that has happened and that is significant that bodes very well for indian startup ecosystem thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today it was wonderful having you here my pleasure i enjoyed it thank you